Okay, so this morning, I wanna continue talking on Paul's prayer motivation, but for the Ephesians, but look a little bit to, a little bit to uh, the content of his prayer. Now, our scripture verse this morning is in Acts 2.42. We will look at that a little bit later. <clears throat> but I want us just to recap on a few things that were said the last time when we were together. Uh, we said that Apostle Paul's prayer, his prayers were not motivated primarily by the Ephesians' physical needs, but his apostolic prayers were more focused on three fundamental things. In the first prayer engagement, he was giving thanks to God for the Ephesians. And this morning, I want us to do that. Let us give thanks to God for our wives, our husbands, our children, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and then in Ephesians 1.16, it says actually there, Paul says, I've never stopped praying and giving thanks unto the Lord for you. And uh, <clears throat> then he also prayed another prayer. <clears throat> he said, I'm asking God to give the Ephesians the spirit of wisdom. Uh, the spirit there is the attitude or the insight that would enable them to perceive reality in Christ accurately, or how to practically walk in the reality of the knowledge of Christ's person, that wisdom he was praying for. And then a third thing, asking God to give the sons of God the spirit of revelation. In other words, the unveiling of Christ, full disclosure of the mystery of Christ. And you know that Paul said many times that I may know Christ. I've counted all things but done for the surpassing value of knowing Christ, Jesus, my Lord. So <clears throat> then he also prayed that the eyes of their heart might be enlightened. So Apostle Paul's prayer for, was praying for an inward posture of heart in which wisdom and revelation would continually define the Ephesians' spiritual posture. He also prays for enlightened hearts, hearts that have been illuminated or to make them understand the knowledge about Christ. So the goal in view was that the Ephesians might gain greater knowledge of God. The Greek word actually for knowledge, epignosis, refers to exact knowledge, complete knowledge, experiential knowledge, not just an abstract, abstract knowledge or a doctrinal knowledge, but really having an experience with a living Christ, uh, a knowledge that can rectify every erroneous position within our hearts and minds. And so Paul wanted the Ephesians to get to know God better. So these are some of the stuff I've spoken to you last time. And uh, today, just a few more thoughts on prayer, which is very important. Uh, to be truly apostolic is to devote ourselves unremittingly to the practice, the discipline, and the art of prayer. So I want to, you know, Jesus said in, in, in Luke 4, 18, he said, men ought always to pray and never to faint. Always to pray and never to faint. So I want us now to look at uh, <clears throat> Acts 2.42. Just, we, we know that verse so well, but it's not just the knowledge of it, but the practice of it. So I want us to see what uh, the Bible means when it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and then he says, and in prayers, plural. There are different types of prayer, but our focus here out of the book of Ephesians has got to do with governmental prayer, a prayer that is not primarily prayed to sustain my own life or that I just want to get something from God. But governmental prayer is to pray away from ourselves into the purposes of God. 
So it says, <clears throat> and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. And that is a divine order. It's a divine arrangement. So when he says continually, steadfastly, he literally means a devotion that they will devote themselves unremittingly, continuously, regularly, being committed to it, faithful, unfaltering. And even when the world does not agree, we will go against that and we will continue to pray. No church, no individual can exist without the practice and the art of prayer. Now, the church at Jerusalem had regular hours of prayer as stated both inside and outside of the temple as stated in Acts 3, 1. It says there, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. So there was something in the book of Acts church as the hour of prayer. And that doesn't literally mean that we might just pray for one hour, but it reflects to us today that prayer was an imperative amongst the apostles. The move of the Holy Spirit in the early church stirred the church's devotion to prayer. The church prayed during crisis moments or when elders were appointed or they were settling disputes amongst themselves or there was resistance from Satan or when there was no real uh, outside threat to their existence. They continued steadfastly in prayer. Prayer was part of the culture of their normal engagement as the body of Christ. It was part of their worldview and their ideology. So we cannot say that we truly are apostolic and we do not follow the injunction that says they continued unremittingly, devotionally giving themselves over to the art and practice of prayer. An apostolic believer or an apostolic son of God is one that is infused with this reality that I need to pray consistently, unremittingly, continuously, not just for myself, but also for my brothers, my sisters, giving thanks to the Lord for their lives and asking God to give all the saints a spirit of wisdom and revelation and that the eyes of their hearts might be enlightened, that they may know Christ better. So I want you just to check through a few verses that I just at random collected out of the book of Acts where they were praying to show you the culture of these people that they, they devoted themselves to prayer. A prayerless saint is an independent saint. When we don't pray, we declare to God, I know it all. Prayer makes us dependent on God. In other words, a dependency on God gets developed by prayer. I love to pray. It's part of the practice of my life. And uh, that is not just for an hour, year, or day. It's daily in different types of prayer. And that has sustained me. It's sustained my family continuously engaging the art and the practice of prayer. Now in Acts 1.14, it says the following about the church in, uh, in, in Jerusalem, in the, the early church. It says, uh, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. There was prayer and supplication. To supplicate means that there is an earnest cry to the Lord to intervene. And then Acts 4, 31 states, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak the word of God with boldness. Boldness is an ingredient of an apostolic culture. 
prayer brings you to a place of that kind of boldness because you have been interacted God, not just as your father, but as a representative of him in the jurisdiction where you find yourself. Then Acts 6, or it says, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. This was the time when they were selecting uh, deacons. And uh, the apostles then said to them, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. If you call yourself an apostle or you are an apostolic believer, you, you give yourself continually over to prayer. Acts, 2, Acts 12, 5 says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Can you see there? Constant. Constant means stretched out. A prayer a prayer with intention that we want to see our brother released from prison. And then Acts 16, 25 to 26, the Bible says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. All of that happened because they began fervently to pray. And then in Acts 20, 36, and when he had said these things, this is Paul, when he was about to leave Ephesus for the last time, and now he called the elders together and he had conversation with them. And after all the talks, the scripture says, and when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with all of them. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sowing, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would not see his face anymore. Now, letters from the apostles to young local households of faith scattered throughout the Roman Empire, contained many, many admonitions to be instant in prayer or to be without ceasing in prayer or to continue in prayer. You cannot be an apostle and never pray. Prayer is part of the spiritual makeup and DNA of an apostolic believer. This is how you operate. This is your culture. This is your worldview. This is your perspective. You continue in prayer. Now, in the New Testament church, prayer is a top priority. No local church or a person can survive or continue if they do not continually giving themselves over to prayer. So Western church culture places emphasis on the individual praying for himself and for his own needs, but at times neglect the dynamic and power of corporate prayer. What I'm talking about this morning is the dynamic of corporate prayer, corporate prayer engagement. Uh, prayer is a top priority in the New Testament church pattern. Uh, now, just lastly, I want to I want to just show us something here. I just I want to just get it here. It's more like a prophecy that the Lord has given that I need to just quickly go through with you. Uh, yeah, here it is. I just want to engage with you on this. Uh, I say here that this is a season for serious prayer and fasting. King David said in Psalm sixty nine verse ten, "I humbled my soul with fasting." Joel 2.12 says, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and fasting and weeping and mourning. We are anticipating the final shutdown of a previous order of Christianity in the earth and its leadership who refused to engage the requirements of the current apostolic season. The next phase of our corporate prophetic journey 
in Christ must be saturated in and by fervent governmental prayer. Prayer initiatives and commitment to regular times of spirit-directed fasting is very important. Uh, Nehemiah 1 and verse 4 states, When I, Nehemiah, heard about the condition of Jerusalem, where the walls were broken down and the gates were burned, I sat down and wept for some days. I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Often prayer and fasting goes together. We will witness, I believe, the greatest outpouring of the spirit uh, directed interventions, healings and miracles and deliverance and the unregenerate humanity coming to Christ. However, we must commit to faithful prayer initiatives that is directed by the Holy Spirit and at times fast, being the Lord's interface, as it were, as our desire for him and his kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, become true reality unto an apostolically infused church. So, dear sons of God, we must learn how to pray like Paul, with a vision that sees what believers will be like when they are infused with hope, excited about the inheritance, and pregnant with power, eager to be used on God's behalf. So as I close this morning, it's short because I want us to engage in a time of prayer on this platform. And uh, we are not going to pray primarily for ourselves, but if you look in the chat, I put there an agenda for prayer. I am convinced that nothing will happen without the church praying. Now, let us look at Jesus as we close before we pray. Matthew 18, 18 to 20 is an instruction coming from Jesus. Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And, whether you, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, the word bind there is to permit, not to permit. And to lose is to permit. Again, verse 19, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them. In other words, the question is, how much do we come into an agreement with others when we pray? Or do you only pray for yourself? Governmental apostolic prayer is never for ourselves. It's not self-focused. It's kingdom-focused. It is focused on behalf of God into the circumstances of life that sometimes dictate the terms. That is why Jesus commanded the fig tree. And so it's the prayer of command. It's the prayer of decree. It's the prayer of proclamation that God is after in an apostolic season. He says, ask and it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And then verse 20 of Matthew 18, Jesus says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So we are more than two years on the platform, and we want to come into agreement this morning to pray for all sorts of things. Now, Jesus' teaching reveals the following elements of corporate prayer. There are four things, and I'm going to stop out of these verses. The power of agreement is the first one. It says, where two of you shall agree, asking anything in my name, you will have it. Where two of you, the word agree is symphony, from where we get the word symphony, to make a sound together that is intelligible, that we harmonize together, and we make a sound in the spirit that will push moderately at the things that resist us in the earth. So the power of agreement, how can two walk together unless they are in agreement? 
How can we walk together unless we agree in prayer? So when the people of God are gathered together in oneness, even if it's only two or three, the grace of God is released to accomplish the will of God. A second point in, out of Jesus' instruction, the power of the presence of the Lord is, will, will be in the midst of the church. Because he says where two or three are gathered together, that words gathered together doesn't speak of an indiscriminate coming together, but it's an assembling that is directed by the Holy Ghost to bring the church together in divine order, to bring the church together in, 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 an, in an, a protocol type of order. And they are being woven together. When they come together in oneness, in a heart that beats for the other, when they really are one in love with one another. Remember what Psalm 133 says, that God commands a blessing. He commands a blessing where the brethren dwell together in oneness. So there is this drive in the earth to maintain the oneness that the Holy Spirit has already established. And so when two or three are led together into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, there he gathers with them. He says, there I am in the midst of them, in the midst of them. So the Lord dwells in the midst of his people when they gather together in oneness, when they are assembled because of his name, which reflects his nature, his authority, and the inherent qualities of who he is, is revealed through his name. So it says when they are assembled because of his name and because of their faith in an identification with him, he is then present to accomplish his own will because we are praying in unison, we are praying one thing, and it arrives in heaven, like David says, I lift my, I lift my, uh, my hands up, and prayer is like the evening sacrifice. It's like incense before the Lord. It rises up before God, and when that incense arrives in heaven, the, the officiating angel that is standing next to the throne, and he then catches up our prayers in golden bowls, says Revelation, and mixes it with the fire from the altar. And then it gets hurled back into the earth and it causes disruptions. It causes within the domains of men and the domains of satanic systems, it causes an upheaval. And so there's a divine partnership in prayer. When we stand praying in the earth, our prayers rises like incense. It gets taken up in heaven. It, get, it gets mixed with the fire of the throne and gets hurled back into earth and it causes things to happen. Third thing, the power to bind, Jesus speaks about. The power to bind, the power of sin and darkness is within our mouths. He says, whatever you bind on earth, will be bound or having been bound in heaven. So heaven is, re, is responding to us binding and then heaven binds what we have bound. But if we don't do anything on earth, heaven will not respond automatically because we are God's divine representatives on earth. And so heaven is consistently waiting for the earth to move so that heaven can respond based on the movements of his people in the earth. So a unified worshiping people will tune in to the initiatives of heaven and heaven and earth will work in tandem, will work together to see God's rule extended. And then lastly, Jesus talks about the power to remove obstacles when he says, whatsoever things you lose, the power to remove obstacles to the church. The power of the presence of the Lord opens doors and makes a way for the unified people of God to do his will. Whatever they lose, 
permit on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Whatever we don't permit, whatever we do permit, will have been loosed and bound in heaven. So that's the power of coming together in prayer. And remember, we are praying every Thursday. I'm doing everything that I'm doing is with divine intent. I'm not just calling people to come and pray. But the Lord instructed me and said, be relentless, unremitting, constant, devote yourself to prayer. So on a Thursday night, we pray. And we are building that fourth pillar right now. And how is it built by the governmental prayer school? On a Thursday, I teach the people how to pray effectively. So we teach them and then we put it into practice so that we understand how prayer works and the dynamics of how to get our prayers answered. So you see, if we say we are apostolic and we don't pray and we don't, and we don't respond to the call for prayer, then it makes me wonder, are you truly apostolic? Apostolicity is going back to the original. And our Jesus, our patent son, he showed us how to pray. The Bible says, when it was yet dark outside, he would get up from his bed, leave the house, go to a lonely place, and there prayed. There were times that Jesus would pray right through the night. Every time a major issue had to be transacted by Jesus, it was preceded by prayer. Because the son is dependent on the father to execute the will in the earth, but he cannot do it independent from the father. As I said earlier on, an independent, non-praying believer is the spirit of, of independence stands in that person. But when we pray, we actually say, Lord, we are dependent upon you. 